Who are the people who were born with crime in their DNA that we covered in 2023? Let's get right to it with this marathon video. What are the types of crimes and scams these ladies are into? Let's find out, starting with number five, burglary in Brazil. A cat burglar has struck in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, as a woman pulled off a daring and lucrative heist at a luxury condo for possibly one last big score. The smooth criminal managed to steal over $190,000 in luxury jewelry, bags, and other expensive items in less than an hour before making her escape. The thief had surveilled the condo and easily gained entrance by telling the doorman she was visiting someone on the 8th floor. But instead of taking the elevator to the 8th floor, she lied. The woman headed up to the 7th floor through the service elevator, totally fooling everyone. When she reached the apartment, the sneaky sneak broke down the door in an unsneaky way, ready to start her 50 minute long search. To cover her tracks, the criminal mastermind had the cunning to put on black gloves. You're probably thinking, what? Black gloves? Was she making a fashion statement? You're going to feel so ridiculous when we tell you it was to hide her fingerprints. She also wore dark sunglasses, not because she was too cool for school, but to obscure her face as she kept her identity a secret. She didn't want anyone to know it was her because she's thinking like 95 steps ahead. In what was likely an effort to taunt the authorities, Maybe there's some detective that's been tracking her for years at the cost of his own marriage. A surveillance camera caught her as she readjusted her hair bun without her identity concealing shades. We have to give it to the girl. Even if she was trying to not be seen, she still got to look good in case she was. After gathering all her spoils, the woman made her escape with a male companion unexpectedly waiting outside the building. It's possible he said something to her about yet another final score, and she was like, USOB, I'm in. Wasting no time, the two ran down the street with the nearly $200,000 worth of items on possibly another daring heist. The owner of the property, who runs a local car dealership, was away on vacation with his family. You know, there's going to be a sequel to this crime where he goes on a worldwide search for her. Everyone was completely shock beyond all expectation when they observed the aftermath of the heist. The doorman was left dumbstruck. He had no clue that the nice lady he let through the door to go to the eighth floor would leave with hundreds of thousands of dollars of jewelry, bags, and other valuable objects, and not even go to the eighth floor. Not even once. The Belo Horizonte police have released two photos of the woman, since she's the only suspect in the case, but good luck making an arrest, guys. You're playing checkers, she's playing chess. Belo Horizonte, with its 2.7 million residents is considered the third safest city in Brazil, according to TravelSafeAbroad.com, which makes the suspect's clean getaway all the more impressive. With a low-down criminal like this running around, though, it may now be the fourth safest. Number four, Mother Teresa of Ponzi. Johanna M. Garcia was many people's saving grace. Advertised as a Mother Teresa and a kindly investor, she promised to help regular people and small businesses generate wealth. She and her company, MJ Capital Funding LLC, sought to make loans and other forms of short-term financing that would yield a robust return on investors' money. She sold this service, known as Merchant Cash Advance, as a way to purchase future receivables and guarantee a steady income flow. In just over a year, Garcia's efforts were highly successful, with over 15,400 investors pooling $196 million. In actuality, what she was doing was less miraculous and more lucrative Ponzi scheme. In this case, Garcia and her team perpetrated the massive fraud by purporting to provide a 10% monthly return and annualized rates of 120% to 180%. However, the money was instead used to grease the palms of company insiders and fund luxury items such as vacations, clothes, and even cryptocurrency. It was only made worse by the fact that unlicensed brokers were used in the sales of securities during the scam. The signs of the company's undoing began to show when a website was created with a URL similar to MJ Capital's called MJ Capital Ponzi that publicly accused the company of running a Ponzi scheme. Garcia responded by suing the website creator, which only aroused 
more suspicion. The next nail in the coffin came in June 2021 when an undercover FBI agent visited their Pompano Beach office. After ascertaining Garcia's identity as the company's leader, they quickly made sense of the situation. Garcia wasn't named in the criminal proceedings against Pavel Ruiz, a company board member, who was charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud. However, the U.S. Attorney's Office didn't confirm or deny the existence of a parallel criminal investigation against her when contacted. Nevertheless, Garcia has reached a partial settlement with the SEC, which would essentially put the agency's complaint against her on the back burner. Ruiz was also met with a similar settlement with monetary relief set to follow the conclusion of any criminal proceedings. He currently remains out on $250,000 bail. Number three, fake cancer, real escort. Tanya Rowe is one of Britain's most notorious and prolific con artists. For over 15 years, she's deceived numerous victims with her crafty tricks and lies. She appeared in court via video link where she pleaded guilty to fraud for forging documents and posing as an international events manager for the high-end jeweler Cartier. Roe, who was actually an escort, had used many identities over the years, a wonder bra model, a barrister, and an Italian heiress. Her newest fraudulent act was to allegedly scheme over 70,000 pounds in gifts and cash from an 83-year-old retired businessman. After taking his money, Roe allegedly used fake Cartier payslips to rent a 250,000 pound apartment. The elderly man, who wasn't named for legal reasons, was entranced when Roe introduced herself as Mia Bella Cavalli, an international events manager with high-end jeweler Cartier, and definitely not an escort. She bamboozled him with stories of her wealth, telling him she had a significant inheritance from her Italian father. The elderly bachelor had met Roe at a restaurant, and he was quickly infatuated. Roe discovered that the man was planning on moving and offered to help him find find a place, and the relationship blossomed. The man was so enamored that he showered Roe with expensive gifts, including a 7,850-pound Rolex watch and a new Ford Focus for her son. We guess a Ford Escort would have been a little on the nose. Not long after, Roe revealed to him that she had breast cancer and was facing eviction from her flat since she hadn't been paid by Cartier. The man bought her story and handed her money. First, 2,200 pounds for rent, then smaller payments of 200 pounds and 400 pounds a day day to help with daily living. In early 2020, he gave her another 28,000 pounds. The retired businessman also believed Roe was in the process of selling a 3.8 million pound house, name-dropping celebrity chef Heston Blumenthal as being interested in buying it. Roe insisted the gifts and cash were gifted as part of a sugar daddy adult relationship. The pensioner claimed their relationship wasn't physical and he had no clue she was an escort. Roe also claimed that the man then became a client, regularly spending 300 pounds for her time, which included intimate special time encounters. Roe also claimed the man became controlling and obsessive, constantly blowing up her phone with texts. He even allegedly gave her a surprise toy that was made gold and platinum and could be used as a uh, personal massager on her doorstep for Christmas. Oddly enough, this was the same Christmas gift we left our Amazon delivery guy for Christmas as well, so his story about there not being a relationship is totally believable. Roe's scheme eventually unraveled in January of 2020 when she was found guilty of fraud after forging Cartier payslips to lease a 250,000 pound apartment. Tanya Rowe has been labeled one of Britain's most prolific con artists with a criminal history spanning over 15 years. Since she was only 18, she has been part of the criminal world. One of her most extreme deceptions came when she convinced a magazine to run a feature story of her battle with terminal breast and ovarian cancer. She even used her position as a cancer patient to move to the countryside and claimed to be a kickboxing instructor and a wonder bra model. After a short while, she started to allege that her lover had cheated on her and soon after left town, saying that her cancer had spread. During her schemes, Roe had used a variety of guises to manipulate people, from an Italian heiress to a barrister, to even convincing small business owners and taxi drivers that she had terminal cancer. She posed as a wealthy individual and used her charisma to make people feel indebted to her, even going so far as to flash details of her own $3 million pound home she claimed she was renting. With every change of town, Roe was able to con again. Roe moved to Windsor and began to create her fake identity as Riley Cruz, eventually finding a property developer she could con out of 30,000 pounds. Finally, she ended up in another small town where she posed as a barrister and conned a pub landlady of 1,500 pounds and a restaurant owner of 4,000 pounds. The lengths Roe had gone to to fraud people were impressive. 
Mrs. Rowe once wanted to take a trip, so she convinced a trusted friend's son to pay for a two-week, all-expenses-paid trip to Vegas, where the pair supposedly blew thousands of dollars. The Kellets, victims of the scam, said that their trip was cut short when Rowe told him her cancer had spread. Rowe would regularly move around, and instead of paying rent on her new properties, she would infiltrate small towns and befriend people. She then used her supposed terminal cancer as an excuse to convince her new acquaintances to pay her rent and deposit money on her behalf so that she couldn't be evicted immediately. In February 2021, Roe made an appearance in court via video link, where she was given a 15-month jail sentence, suspended for 18 months for her scheme to scam her sugar granddaddy. While she may have put on a show of remorse, the jury was unable to reach a verdict on whether or not she defrauded the elderly businessman or if he had willingly given her the money. It has been suggested that Roe's false identity has become part of her identity. Her inability to resist her sinister ways gives reason to believe that it might only be a matter of time before she strikes again. It remains to be seen whether she's actually remorseful or whether she'll keep lying and deceiving her way back to freedom. If Tanya Rowe can't clean up her act, she'll end up getting escorted to jail. Number two, seven years of fraud. Santa Derbis was recently convicted of fraud-related offenses and sentenced to prison. Her crimes included swindling over $2 million from a group of seven lonely men between 2008 and 2014 in order to fund her extravagant lifestyle. Derbis used a complex web of lies to deceive her victims, building their trust by posing as a wealthy Egyptian with whom they could share a relationship. She would request help with seemingly legitimate payments such as bank charges, taxes, and solicitor fees in exchange for promises of an impending inheritance. Derbis's lies were far-reaching and frequent, such as claiming to need funds for her dead mother's funeral, her son passing away due to swine flu, and her unborn child to a terrible ex-partner. She would engage men in a romantic manner, texting them that she loved them and couldn't wait to be with them, followed by saying she hadn't eaten since yesterday. The men were also asked to pay for fictitious hotel rooms, which Derbis would never appear for, claiming her sick family members were preventing her from attending their scheduled rendezvous. Even when the men became suspicious and reported the fraud, Derbis would respond by asking how just borrowing money can be considered a fraud. Derbis's defense lawyer attributed her actions to desperation and need after having to provide for four children and also act as a care for her mother and brother. However, police fraud squad commander Arthur Katsagianis was quick to point out that the victim's courage to come forward and follow through with the case shows the gravity of her behavior. Derbis's sentencing judge also noted Derbis's talent for impersonation, intricate web of lies, and utterly determined mindset in obtaining the funds. The fallout of the sentencing didn't finish in the courtroom either. Derbis's family and friends who had come to show their support were furious as they clashed with nine and seven news camera crews, even resulting in a seven news reporter being knocked to the ground. Even so, the police assured the reporters of an investigation and eventual prosecution of those responsible, and Jason Morrison, the seven news Sydney director, was pleased to state that the report reporter was found unharmed and the cameraman only suffered minor injuries. Derbis was handed a three and a half year sentence with a non-parole period of 18 months. Number one, the Vax cards weren't the only fakes. Internet sleuths were shocked when Jasmine Clifford, a woman from New Jersey who had the Instagram moniker at anti Mama, found to be behind a massive fake coronavirus vaccination card scheme. Better known as a five-star Jazzy, Clifford was an exotic dancer that seems to have awarded herself only 5 out of 10 stars. Clifford was alleged to have sold roughly 250 forged cards through her Instagram account, as well as worked with another woman who had access to a medical clinic in Patogi, New York. The main culprit behind the scheme was Clifford, but her accomplice, Nadeza Barkley, was charged with a felony as well. 13 customers, many of whom were medical professionals, were also charged with felonies. Clifford advertised a stripped-down card at $200 and offered a premium one for $250 to enter the customer's name into New York's official immunity database. Once in the database, they could obtain a digital certification of vaccinations. Clients could likely also pay for the cards in ones. Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance caught wind of the scam and appealed to Facebook to take action against the fraud and warned that forged vaccination cards could have serious public safety consequences. Facebook acted swiftly, removing Clifford's 
account and promising to review any other accounts where counterfeit cards are being advertised. Little did anyone know, a TikToker by the name of Atizient had already highlighted Clifford's fraudulent activity weeks before. Michael, the independent filmmaker behind the TikTok handle, was committed to fighting off misinformation spread through social media. After experiencing the loss of a loved one due to COVID-19, Michael was appalled to see Clifford's dangerous workaround online. Michael's video prompted Clifford's investigation and subsequent legal actions, although the charges were brought against the accused beforehand. Using his online presence, Michael alerted Manhattan prosecutors to Clifford's scheme, which then led to an undercover investigation in late June. According to the criminal complaint against Clifford's co-conspirator, Nadeza Barclay, one undercover customer was able to pay Clifford $200 for a card and was sent a copy of the forged recordings. An additional undercover customer was able to provide Clifford information to input the New York State vaccination database as well as $250 for her service. The investigation into Clifford and Barkley was ongoing for two months until Michael's video was released to the public. In the end, 13 people were charged with criminal possession of a forged instrument and Barkley, who worked in a medical clinic in Patogi, was charged with offering a false instrument for filing and conspiracy. Clifford, who ironically ran a boutique where people put clothes on, was also charged with two felonies and one misdemeanor related to the scheme. What are the most despicable crimes people will do? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. Prince Scamming Shereza Jackson thought she had hit the jackpot when she reconnected with Dorian Wilkerson. Little did she know that reconnecting with him would be the greatest mistake of her life. She had known Wilkerson since high school and remembered him as a good-looking athletic guy who played football and ran track. And while Wilkerson did run something, it turns out it wasn't track. It was a scam that cost Shereza about $1.4 million. When they reconnected, Shereza was a single mother raising two daughters with a high-flying career as a regional director at a Fortune 500 company. Wilkerson told her that she wasn't doing badly for himself either and that he was a medical doctor who also worked at the CDC. Shereza believed Wilkerson was the last missing piece in her life, and she fell completely in love with her Prince Charming. Two years later, the couple tied the knot in front of 200 guests. The relationship was supposed to open a new chapter of bliss in Shereza's life, but all it ended up doing was running her into over a million dollars in debt and handing her a divorce barely seven years later. The fairy tale turned horror story started simply when Wilkerson messaged her through Facebook. He told her that he had become a doctor at Emory Hospital in Atlanta and an epidemiologist for the CDC. Shereza wasn't doing bad for herself either, and she liked that he was accomplished, driven, and also seemed to have a passion for philanthropy. At the time, Wilkerson lived in Atlanta and Shereza lived in Florida, so they didn't meet up right away. However, a business trip took Shereza to Atlanta, and Wilkerson was on hand to welcome her. He took her to his apartment, and they had a fantastic time getting reacquainted. He showered her with gifts and attention, and she soon fell in love with him. They got married, and her daughters were so smitten by him that they even changed their last names to his. But then, Wilkerson started to show his true colors. A year into their marriage, Wilkerson insisted that Shereza open a cosmetic center that would offer breast augmentation, tummy tucks, and Brazilian butt lifts. Shereza provided around $400,000 in startup capital from her retirement. Wilkerson was in charge of the day-to-day -day activities of the center, but months later, Shereza discovered that the place was losing money. It was so bad that she had to quit her job and take over operations full-time to stop the place from going out of business. She asked Wilkerson about the missing money from the center, but he always had an excuse that explained things. That was when Shereza started hearing troubling stories from other people. Friends of Wilkerson's ex-wife texted her and told her about how he had scammed his ex for 16 years. Of course, Shereza didn't want to believe the stories, but she had no choice when she saw a text from Wilkerson to his friend saying he no longer wanted to be with her because she was broke. Shereza then found out that Wilkerson had been using her name to get thousands of dollars in loans and had been stealing from her through 
through her credit card. She also found out that he wasn't a doctor and had actually received a cease and desist letter from the Florida Department of Health. But somehow, that was just the beginning. Further digging revealed that not only was Wilkerson not a doctor, but he was actually a convicted felon who was on probation. Because <laughs> why not? Wilkerson had been arrested for fraud in 2002. Then there were the charges for beating someone up in 2007, and the same charges again in 2009. His 2002 arrest was based on charges of extorting and defrauding someone of over $75,000. But somehow, Wilkerson had managed to avoid doing any sort of time behind bars. When Shereza finally confronted him with evidence of his past, he tried to file some nonsense police report about their joint finances to get her arrested, but it didn't work. In the end, Shereza filed for divorce and brought a civil suit against Wilkerson. The suit outlined Wilkerson's pattern of lies and mischief and also alleged that he was unfaithful in his marriage to Shereza. Shereza is trying to rebuild her life and has released a book talking about her experience with Wilkerson called Successful Women Get Played Too. What's crazy about this story is that even though Wilkerson scammed Shereza out of over a million dollars, somehow the guy still isn't in jail. She said she thinks he's living with some new girl now, probably up to his same old tricks. Number four, the fake inheritance. Steve Edward Riley Jr. had his life taken by his girlfriend after she found out he was going to be $30 million richer through an inheritance. She thought poisoning him would allow her to claim the inheritance, which wasn't only just incorrect, but no such inheritance actually existed. Before there was even any talk of an inheritance, Steve had wanted to break up with his girlfriend, Ina Thea Knoyer. Knoyer was apparently a lazy, jobless mooch to Steve, and Steve's patient had worn thin. They both knew their relationship was on its last legs. But once Steve got news of the phantom $30 million inheritance he was about to get, everything changed. Breaking up with his girlfriend now seemed a distant concern that paled in comparison to securing the inheritance. But here's the thing. Steve had no wealthy relatives that he could reasonably expect such an inheritance from. And yet, somehow, he truly believed that it was real all the same. Unfortunately, Steve wasn't the only one thinking of securing the inheritance. Knoyer, some somehow believed in an obscure law that said long-term girlfriends of deceased men could be seen as their common-law wives, and as such, they would be entitled to inheritance of such deceased persons. To Knoyer, this meant that the only obstacle to obtaining the $30 million for herself was Steve. So, she filled his beer cup with antifreeze, somehow got him to drink it, then didn't call the cops until a day later as Steve became more and more sick. When paramedics eventually arrived, Steve was far too sick to completely recover, and he passed away a day after being admitted to a hospital. When asked what happened, Knoyer said that he'd been drinking beer the day before and had gotten a heat stroke. However, an autopsy proved that Steve hadn't drunk beer the day before. A search of the premises revealed a Windex bottle suspected to contain antifreeze, as well as a beer bottle and a mug that were suspected to contain antifreeze. And thus, Knoyer was arrested. After interrogating Knoyer, she confessed to the police that she thought she would be entitled to Steve's inheritance because she was his common-law wife. Unfortunately for her, the state she lived in didn't recognize that statue, so Steve's passing was for nothing. Perhaps she should have done some light Googling before trying to take someone's life over some outdated law. What makes the case even worse is that investigators later discovered that there was no inheritance and that Steve had probably fallen for a scam. So Knoyer just planned the dumbest and most despicable crime for nothing. Although he can't figure out why Steve thought that he was getting that much money from a rich family member he didn't know of in the first place, why on earth would he tell his girlfriend he was was planning to break up with that he had a huge inheritance coming. Number three, the rogue contractor. Alan Middleton swindled his clients out of more than a half a million pounds through a comprehensive and complex operation that took authorities months to uncover. Middleton spent the money he got from the fraud on expensive trips to Gibraltar and the Italian Grand Prix. He essentially had the time of his life on other people's dime. Middleton ran a construction company that took steps to get contracts dishonestly. First, he forged a Federation of Master Builders insurance document to suggest he was insured to perform construction jobs. Second, he told his clients that he only worked on one job at a time, but they would later find out that he was working on several projects at the same time, and he hardly completed them. Third, Middleton inflated supplier invoices and faked his VAT number, which is like a US tax ID number, all in a bid to extract more money from his clients. Then he made sure he never told his clients that his construction company had been previously bankrupt, which was a crime in itself. And finally, he refused to complete the job 
jobs he had been paid fully for. But Middleton and his wife, Katie Middleton, who didn't marry Prince William, were just crooks in the office. They were also crooks at home. The Middletons committed mortgage fraud by pretending they weren't in a relationship and that Katie earned a salary of over 100,000 pounds. If they hadn't run this part of the fraud, they might not have landed the mortgage because of Middleton's bankruptcies. But the Middletons couldn't get away with their scheming ways forever. They were reported to the authorities and investigations of their business practices began. Alan Middleton tried to go under the radar by changing his name, but it was too late. He was eventually arrested, prosecuted, and jailed for a total of four years and six months. Katie got a nine-month sentence that was suspended for 18 months. Sadly, Middleton's clients still have to bear the cost of their unfinished construction projects, and their story is hardly unique. Pretty much everyone has a horror story about a nightmare contractor and the toll on the victims of shoddy home construction and renovation is far more catastrophic than you think. So this is a fantastic reminder to make sure and vet anyone doing work on your home. It's just so easy for them to take shortcuts, not to do things to code or to just abandon the job altogether. Remember, you pay for what you get. Number two, like father, like son. Gaston de la Torre, son of notorious Argentinian bank robber Ruben Alberto de la Torre, was arrested in connection to an investigation into a large nose beer distribution network. And yes, nose beers are exactly the type of beer you're thinking of, but less beer-y and more powder-y. Gaston's father Ruben is one of Argentina's most dangerous criminals and is infamous for the robbery of the century, which saw $15 million stolen from a bank in Argentina in 2006. Unfortunately for Ruben, and fortunately for the people of Argentina, he didn't get away with his crime and was sentenced to 15 years in prison thanks to his wife. Ruben's son resumed his father's criminal career. Gaston popped up on police radar because of his dealings with a known criminal organization that was looking to transport truckloads of nose beers into Buenos Aires. This led to a sting operation where Gaston was arrested with eight other guys involved in the business. The police confiscated Gaston's Chevy Cruze, several cell phones, Phones, two laptops, a tablet, security surveillance cameras, and a notepad. They also confiscated the nose beers that Gaston and his gang were moving. Knowing Gaston's history and who his father was kind of makes you feel a bit bad for the guy. His father was a hardened criminal and he's found his way into that life as well. Do you think Gaston was always doomed to a life of crime because of his father? Let us know in the comments. Number one, their parents didn't matter. Gary Mansell and his second wife, Diane, worked very hard to defraud Gary's parents, ensuring they spent the last days of their lives in horrifying conditions and pennies to their name. The sad story all began when Fred Mansell, Gary's father, who was 77 years old at the time, suffered a fall and went to a rehabilitation clinic. His wife, Enid, at the time, was showing signs of dementia, so a decision to move her into her son's detached home was made. The couple granted their son power of attorney and gave him the responsibility of caring for them and also taking care of their property, which was worth over 250,000 pounds. The plan was that Gary and his wife would look after Fred and his wife so they didn't need to go into a care home in their old age. Instead of doing that, Gary and his wife decided to ignore his parents and live large on their dime. First of all, Gary sold his parents' house for 100,000 pounds less than it was worth, which is just so stupid, just so he could get his hands on the cash and spend it on a lavish new extension and kitchen. But instead of using that new kitchen to cook meals for the people that wiped his butt for him when he was little, Gary gave his parents pathetic microwave dinners and let them sit totally isolated in the home extension. The care Fred and Enid got was likely far worse than they would have gotten in a care home. Gary held a good job that paid almost 100,000 pounds a year, and Diane ran a curtain business until it went bankrupt. The pair lived a comfortable life, but it didn't afford them the sort of luxury they thought they were entitled to. So when Gary's parents' fortune and power of attorney dropped in his lap, he splurged. The couple had steak dinners, flew in first-class cabins, went on expensive trips to Jamaica and Cape Verde, and even bought a brand new Land Rover. The couple also had expensive stays in hotels and spent money on designer bags and scents. Diane spent over 9,000 pounds on cosmetic work as well. While all of this happened, 
Fred and his wife Enid were almost completely isolated at home. During their three and a half year stay with Gary, they only went on vacation once to Wales where they barely left the hotel. Sadly, Enid passed away and Fred finally realized what his only son had been doing with his money. The knowledge broke him so much that he said he no longer wanted to live. Social workers got involved, and Fred had to be moved into a care home while Gary and his wife faced the music. The couple had their day in court, and a disgusted judge sentenced both of them to prison for six years. The judge said that they had both carried out the most despicable display of greed and vanity he had ever seen just so that they could live the life of their dreams. It's hard to disagree with that. Who are the people who are simply born for crime? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. The Black Widows In Buenos Aires, Argentina, two women, Sabrina Cynthia Novillo and Pamela Sosa, were finally captured after a string of robberies targeting wealthy businessmen in the city. Between 2018 and 2020, Novillo and Sosa were involved in at least five robberies that involved seducing men then robbing them. They would set up meetings under the guise of business propositions only to betray their victims once their guard was down. One of their targets was a construction company owner whom they met at a restaurant. Engaging him in friendly conversation, the women were invited to his home in the affluent neighborhood of Nordelta. Over a few drinks, one of the women secretly, let's call it, amended his cocktail, leaving him unconscious. They then stole his BMW, along with 70,000 in US dollars, 30,000 in Argentine pesos, and three luxury watches. Another victim was a businessman who met Navillo and Sosa through WhatsApp. After inviting them to his apartment for a business proposition, he fell victim to the same scam, when Navillo and Sosa put some sort of sleepy time in his drink. The man woke up the next morning and discovered that $70,000, a Rolex, a Hublot watch, his iPhone, and his Toyota Corolla had all been stolen. The most famous of their victims was Argentine soccer player Walter Boos. Boosie took Novillo and another woman to his home, only to wake up the following afternoon to find out that they stole his laptop, iPad, two phones, a camera, his television, and his Mini Cooper, and his dog which is super weird. They were like, let's rip this guy off and take on some new responsibilities. Authorities finally caught up with Navillo and Sosa and they were arrested at a party in Buenos Aires. The charges filed against them ranged from multiple counts of robbery to contraband related offenses. Navillo was handed a three year suspended sentence following an eight month detention in federal prison as authorities probed her involvement in the robberies. Sosa was probably just put in time out and told to think about what she did. Number four, a long vacation. Cinzio Paulina De Leo is a former teacher in Venice, Italy, who managed to evade going to work for a whopping 20 years, thanks to her clever manipulation of sick leave, holiday time, and conference permits. De Leo worked at a secondary school teaching literature and philosophy, but out of the 24 years that she was supposed to be at work teaching, De Leo only showed up for four of them. She didn't really even do anything. During exams, her students caught her playing on her phone, and she randomly assigned grades without even looking at what was turned in. She didn't even have a copy of the required textbook for her lessons. It's like the worst kid in your high school class suddenly became a teacher and behaved exactly as you'd expect them to. Despite her prolonged absence and lackluster performance, De Leo claimed to possess three degrees, attempting to justify her position as an educator. We bet she just bought one on Amazon. When approached by journalists for a statement, De Leo declined to provide any comment because she said she was at the beach. Eventually, her long-standing misconduct caught the attention of school inspectors who gently described her teaching as confused and fired her. De Leo, not one to just give up a good thing, appealed the decision and somehow got the court to reinstate her, leaving everyone to describe them as confused. However, the true extent of De Leo's negligence came to light, revealing that she had barely worked during her entire employment. The court, realizing how ridiculous they looked, reversed its decision and terminated her for good. As news of her unprecedented absenteeism spread, Cincio Paulina de Leo earned the dubious title of Italy's worst employee. Obviously, everyone is right to be outraged, but once you 
you look past that, she pulled this scam off for 24 years? Then she got caught and fired, and instead of being like, well, it was a good run, she appeals it and wins? We're starting to think Miss DeLeo has a lot more to teach than it seems. Number three, check the vendors. Okay, Rika Wortman is a former Amazon operations manager who orchestrated a massive fraud scheme against Amazon. She managed to steal nearly $10 million using fake invoices. Wortham also known by getting coworkers to enter the fake data into Amazon's vendor payment system. This allowed Wortham to submit over $10 million in invoices and Amazon unsuspectingly transferred roughly $9.4 million to pay these fake vendor bills. Wortham spent lavishly on extravagant items such as buying a 2019 Lamborghini Urus, a 2022 Tesla Model X, and a 2018 Porsche Panamera. Additionally, she bought a home in Smyrna, Georgia, which she shared with co-conspirator Brittany Hudson. Hudson, who was romantically involved with Wortham, owned a business known as Legend Express, which had an agreement with Amazon to deliver packages. Additionally, Wortham enlisted Demetrius Hines, an employee in Amazon's loss prevention department, and Laquitia Blaine Blanchard, a senior human resources assistant, to help with the scam. Hines and Blanchard provided Wortham with names and social security numbers that were used to create fake vendor accounts in Amazon's system. These co-conspirators helped Wortham maintain the facade of legitimacy for her fake vendors. The fraud was so good that it continued even after Wortham left her position at Amazon. Alongside her partner and other co-conspirators, Wortham maintained her criminal activities for a little over two years. Wortham was arrested and jailed not long long after leaving, and a judge set the terms and conditions for her bail order. She was let go on a $5,000 bond, assuming she doesn't break any other laws. So, Wortham forged court documents and misrepresented her criminal charges to a franchising company, Crew Lounge. She tried to open a hookah lounge in Atlanta with Hudson, and when Crew asked about the Amazon fraud charges, Wortham allegedly provided false information, saying the charges were, had been dismissed. She even emailed fake court documents, complete with a forged signature of a U.S. district judge, along with court clerk seals. Wortham's bond was then revoked due to allegations of new criminal conduct. Somehow, Crew found out about the forged documents, and Wortham was popped right back into jail. After Wortham's bond was revoked, she faced new charges for defrauding crew and forging the documents. Wortham was also charged with other various offenses, including fraud, forgery, and obstruction of justice. She was sentenced to 16 years in federal prison. Additionally, she was ordered to pay restitution to Amazon in the amount of $9,469,731.45, forfeit over $2.7 million in fraudulent proceeds, and give up her assets purchased with the stolen money. Given how much money Amazon makes, it's almost surprising they even noticed. She must have thought Bezos was too busy sending giant blue phalluses into space to notice the chump change that the company was losing. Number two, the oldest invention. Ray Brewer from Porterville, California, was sentenced to almost seven years in prison for orchestrating a multi-million dollar Ponzi scheme centered around cow manure and green energy. For nearly five years, Brewer tricked investors into believing that his company, CH4 Power, had built anaerobic digesters on dairies in California and Idaho. The anaerobic digesters supposedly produced methane, which could be sold as green energy. To convince investors, Brewer took them on tours of the dairies, showed them forged lease agreements, and altered bank statements and contracts to make it seem like he had secured revenue streams from multinational companies. He also sent pictures of the digesters under construction and made up construction schedules, invoices, and power generation reports to alleviate shareholder concerns. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, Brewer talked about his business model, claiming to have faced skepticism from dairy farming clients. Nonetheless, investors still handed over $8.7 million, expecting a 66% return on net profits and tax incentives. But Brewer's claims were the real bull manure, and instead of investing the money, he diverted it into multiple bank accounts under different entities, family members, and an alias. He used the money to purchase properties, including two plots of land, a 3,700-square-foot home, and a new Dodge Ram. When investors grew suspicious, Brewer assumed a new identity and took off to a property he'd purchased in Montana with the stolen money. When Brewer was finally arrested, he told law enforcement he had been in the 
Navy and told them how he saved soldiers during a fire. It was some sort of sympathy play or something. Like they were going to be like, oh, okay, well, have a nice day, sir. Brewer eventually pleaded guilty to wire fraud, money laundering, and identity theft charges. As a result, he was sentenced to six years and nine months in prison. Number one, the fake Prince of Bel-Air. Fairy Dune, Prince Fred, Kalilien, was accused of putting out a hit on a documentary filmmaker, $20,000. Kalilien was a prominent figure in Florida's nightlife circles. In 2005, he partnered with Paris Hilton to open Club Paris, an Orlando nightclub that quickly became a celebrity hotspot. As the owner of Club Paris, Kalilien was close to many celebrities, like the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, and even professional golfer slash philanderer Tiger Woods. Kalilien had the modest dream of becoming an international nightclub franchise owner, reality TV star, billionaire, and future governor of Florida. He might as well have added Spider-Man to that list. The club brought him quite a bit of media attention, but despite initial success, the relationship between Kalilian and Hilton fell apart when Hilton failed to show up for her required appearances. Despite his apparent success in the nightlife scene, Kalilian's life was marred by a series of previous crimes. Kalilian's partnership with Hilton came to an end when he fired her from Club Paris. The club shut down the following year, and the contract controversy surrounding Kalilian began to overshadow his ambitions. Then, Kalilian decided to go after a filmmaker referred to only as Victim 1 in the court filings. Kalilian's association with Victim 1 began when they met at a computer repair store. Kalilian offered Victim 1 a job at his company, My Car Solutions, and was a robocall service offering extended warranties for vehicles. Maybe you've had them call you. Surprise! It was a scam. Those calls were so annoying, and this was the guy behind them. Talk about somebody needing a punch in the mouth. A few months later, the FTC shut down the company and fined Kalilian $4 million. Kalilian was banned from telemarketing and was referred to as the king of robocallers. Oddly, this wasn't his first encounter with the FTC. A decade earlier, Kalilian was banned from all travel-related telemarketing and paid $185,000 in fines. Despite his various legal problems, Kalilian maintained his lifestyle, which included luxury vehicles, expensive jewelry, and a team of bodyguards. Kalilian allegedly dropped 50 grand in a single night at a nightclub and said he was a royal prince from the Middle East. Around that same time, an indigenous Iowa tribe entered into an agreement with Kalilian to launch a gambling website and paid him around $9 million for the software. When it didn't work, Kalilian refused to refund them. He didn't want to just limit himself to scamming through robocallers, you know? But at the time, he was also the chief operating officer at Monster Products, the company behind Beats and Dre phones. Kalilian convinced Monster Products to buy a 49% stake in the Iowa's tribe gambling website. But they found themselves in a legal dispute when two other tribes, the Cheyenne and Arapaho, filed a lawsuit against Kalilian in federal court. They accused him of cheating them out of $13 million three years earlier, the same scam. Not long after, Monster Products announced that Kalilian was fired when it was learned that he was threatening employees and their families. The following year, Kalilian was held accountable for swindling a former business partner and the money he took was spent on luxury purchases such as Rolexes, a Lamborghini, and stays at high-end hotels. Years later, Victim 1 happened to bump into Kalilian again. Intrigued by Kalilian's past and seeking to expose him as a fraud, Victim 1 decided to make a documentary. He convinced Kalilian to participate, downplaying its true nature and emphasizing the publicity it could generate. If you didn't pick up on this, the guy has an ego, so it was an easy sell. But Kalilian's initial enthusiasm for the project quickly faded. He confided in his bodyguard, some dude named Michael, that he saw Victim 1 as a former employee who was trying to ruin him, which he was. Kalilian also believed that Victim 1 was trying to hack his social media accounts, which he also was. Unable to deal with working for a guy like Kalilian, Michael eventually quit his position as bodyguard. But the station took a dark turn months later after Victim 1 made 20 calls to Kalilian's phone using spoof numbers, aiming to record an incriminating statement. Enraged by the calls, Kalilian threatened Victim 1. Seriously, listening to this guy totally lose it must have been hilarious. Kalilian was also so flipped out by the whole thing that he called up Michael to arrange a hit on Victim 1, which makes sense to ask a guy to commit a serious crime after he quit working for you because you were too much. However, Michael agreed and said he knew three guys that would do it, but Michael, not being a dummy, instead called Victim 1 and told him what was going on. The two men hatched a plan to fake Victim 1's demise with staged photos as proof, convinced Kalilian that the hit on Victim 1 was complete. Kalilian got the pictures and paid 
Michael $6,500 through Cash App. Victim 1 had also reported the hit to the FBI, leading to Michael making recorded calls with Kalilian to gather evidence. During the calls, Kalilian confirmed his involvement and asked if the victim's body would be hidden. The FBI arrested Kalilian in Las Vegas and was charged. It seems weird, but if no harm results from the hit, the charge carries through a sentence ranging from 0 to 10 years, along with the possibility of a fine. This guy deserves 10 times the sentence just for the robocalls alone. It's not often that we do stories where we were directly affected by a suspect. Shout out in the comments if you got them too. These are some of the most wildest people who will do just about any crime. Let's get right into it, starting with... Number six, just shut up and let me invest your money. Brent Seaman, a Florida Forex trader, found himself at the center of a $35 million scam that targeted elderly and retired members of his church. Seaman allegedly preyed on approximately 60 investors, luring them in with the promise of annual returns ranging from 18 to 48%. He said the investments were safe and that the returns were guaranteed, leading his victims to believe they were making secure financial decisions. But instead of delivering on his promises, Seaman allegedly misappropriated millions of dollars for his personal use, including indulgent purchases of luxury cars and trips on private jets. He also used a portion of the funds to make payments to earlier investors, effectively perpetuating a Ponzi scheme that relied on new investments to pay out old returns. What makes this case really messed up is that Seaman's victims were his fellow church members. Taking advantage of their trust and vulnerability, Seaman targeted these elderly and retired individuals, exploiting their savings for his own financial gain. He not only betrayed their trust, but also jeopardized their financial security. Seaman portrayed himself as a successful venture capitalist and foreign currency trader through his company, Axenito Capital Group. He touted his proven success in currency trading, yet in reality, his trading endeavors were very unprofitable, leading to the loss of millions of dollars in investor funds. The repercussions went beyond just Brent Seaman. His wife was implicated in the alleged scam and was named as a relief defendant. In response to their actions, Seaman and his wife have consented to a settlement with the SEC. Seaman will be barred from serving as an officer or director of any SEC reporting company under the terms of the settlement. Brent Seaman was actually so bad at investing that he was in debt over $14 million when he filed for bankruptcy 10 years before he ripped off his church. It's like he managed to turn a $14 million personal debt into a $35 million church scam. Proof that if at first you don't succeed at getting rich, why not just give outright fraud a shot? Number five, psychiatrist holding patients against their will. Dr. Brian Hyatt, a prominent psychiatrist in Arkansas, has come under intense scrutiny for his alleged involvement in a massive Medicaid scam that involved holding patients against their will. Hyatt is currently under investigation by both state and federal authorities and is facing lawsuits from at least 26 patients who claim they were unlawfully detained part of his scheme. Over a span of 14 months, Dr. Hyatt was accused of orchestrating a sophisticated insurance fraud operation by exploiting vulnerable patients. The patients, many of whom were seeking psychiatric care, were held against their will in his facility, sometimes for weeks on end. The allegations paint a disturbing picture of Dr. Hyatt, with patients claiming that they were essentially imprisoned. Despite the fact that Dr. Hyatt was responsible for their treatment, video footage shows him spending minimal time with his patients, often merely passing them in the hallways without engaging in meaningful interactions. The patients said that their pleas for release fell on deaf ears and that they were subjected to conditions akin to those of a prison. The allegations highlight Dr. Hyatt's alleged insurance scam, where he billed Medicaid for patients he barely saw or interacted with. Medicaid paid out over $800,000 to his facility over three and a half years, an amount that was far more than any other Arkansas psychiatrist. These payments were made despite evidence suggesting that Dr. Hyatt had very limited direct involvement with his patients. Investigations revealed that Dr. Hyatt interacted with patients a mere 17 times over a 45-day surveillance period, amounting to less than 10 minutes per patient. This level of interaction stands in stark contrast to the 
severity of billing codes he reportedly used for his claims. Dr. Hyatt apparently manipulated the Medicaid billing system by claiming to treat patients he rarely saw, maximizing his reimbursements. The allegations resulted in significant legal action against Dr. Hyatt and the institutions associated with him. Northwest Medical Center, where he served as the medical director of the Behavioral Health Unit, settled for $1.1 million due to insufficient documentation for patient hospitalizations. The whole ordeal sounds like a nightmare scenario from a horror movie, doesn't it? People just go in to get medication adjusted. The next thing you know, the football dad looking doctor is trying to release eldritch horrors in the basement. Number four, she didn't start the fire. Courtney Sellers from Screven, Georgia, allegedly coerced her stepchild into setting their home on fire not once, but twice, as part of a scheme to fraudulently claim insurance money. The Georgia Borough of Investigation said that the Jessup Fire Department responded to a fire at their residence, only to uncover evidence suggesting that Sellers had orchestrated the blaze for financial gain. Upon thorough examination of footage and interviews, investigators concluded that Sellers had convinced her stepchild to start fires in their home all for the purpose of collecting insurance payouts. Fire and Lighting Claims Insurance, typically covering the destruction caused by fires, had an average payout of $77,340. Following an inquiry by the state fire marshal's office in response to the Jessup Fire Department's request, Sellers was arrested. Wayne County Sheriff's Office provided video and audio evidence from the day of the fire, which led to charges against Sellers. Her alleged actions carry a potential prison sentence of at least nine years. And this is just our opinion. Maybe we're crazy for having it, but we're gonna say it anyway. Courtney Sellers is not a responsible stepmother. Uh, feel free to disagree with us in the comments if you like, but that's our hot take and we're sticking to it. Number three, Forever Piggy Bank. Over a 14 month span, Daniel Cuthbert carried out a heartless scheme preying on his own grieving father to steal $70,000. Cuthbert systematically drained his father's entire life savings, exploiting a trust that should have been sacred. Even though his dad was suspicious about his savings slowly disappearing, Cuthbert continued to take the money as though it was his. His father, even attempting to confront Daniel about the theft, was just too stricken with grief to really push the matter further. Cuthbert used various tactics to extract the money, he moved substantial sums into his personal account, and even impersonated his deceased mother mother in phone calls to banks so he could transfer funds on at least eight occasions. His manipulative calls involved him adopting a female voice to assume the role of his deceased mother, tricking the employees into making the transfers. Cuthbert also took out loans under his father's name, resulting in the father losing his house as he became engulfed in insurmountable debt. Cuthbert was ultimately arrested, pleaded guilty to false representation, was jailed for two years, and got slapped with a five-year restraining order. It's crazy that someone could look at their own father so stricken with grief over the loss of his wife that he can't hardly function in his daily life and think, well, here's an opportunity. That dude wiped your butt, Daniel. He deserved better from you. Number two, not grandpa too. Nicole Taylor from the United Kingdom scammed her own grandfather, Norman Glover, an 80-year-old retired soccer referee. Taylor exploited her grandfather's vulnerability and trust, ultimately stealing his life savings amounting to 37,000 pounds. Over a span of 14 months, Taylor systematically drained her grandfather's bank account, frequently taking out a thousand pounds per day. But instead of using the money on anything worthwhile, she frittered it away with vacations, tattoos, contraband, and other frivolous expenses. Norman Glover, who once led a respected life as a prominent referee, found himself at the mercy of his granddaughter's exploitation after he was diagnosed with dementia. Taylor exploited her power of attorney to divert funds meant for his care into her own account, leaving him dependent on charity. Norman's daughter, Caroline Spindler, spoke out about the family's outrage when they found out what Taylor was doing. Caroline talked about how her father had supported Taylor, even though they weren't biologically related and had nurtured a close relationship with her. Their relationship was was a testament to Norman's compassion, as Taylor was actually his step-granddaughter, the biological granddaughter of his second wife, Judith Glover. Despite their lack of biological ties, Norman treated Taylor as if she were actual family. As Norman's health deteriorated due to his dementia, Taylor manipulated her way into getting power of attorney and started to shift funds from his accounts to her own. Caroline, who's Norman's actual daughter, was concerned about the power of attorney arrangement, but Taylor and her family ignored her. Taylor also managed to remove Caroline as the next of kin and had obtained power of attorney without her knowledge. This allowed
allowed her to continue her scam unchecked as she spent lavishly using Norman's funds. Taylor's exploitation of her grandfather began when his dementia became more severe and she stole his wallet. Norman told Caroline, but sadly, she dismissed him as being confused and agitated due to his condition. The situation began to unravel when Judith Glover, Taylor's biological grandmother and Norman's second wife, passed away due to bowel cancer. Following this event, Caroline initiated legal actions and Norman's bank accounts were examined, leading to an investigation by the Office of the Public Guardian. Ultimately, Taylor's activities were uncovered, leading to her arrest. In court, she admitted to theft and was sentenced to 14 months in jail. While the family took solace in the fact that justice had been served, the emotional scars and devastation caused by Taylor's actions remain. Fortunately, Norman Glover's bank, TSB, agreed to reimburse him in full under their fraud refund guarantee, bringing some relief to a situation marked by betrayal and heartbreak. Number 1. Fake Plastic Surgeon Matteo Politi posed as a world-renowned plastic surgeon. As Dr. Matthew Mode, no relation to Edna, Politi managed to fool both medical professionals and patients alike. And this wasn't the first time he had attempted such a ruse. Politi had already been exposed for a similar con in his native Italy a few years before, although he managed to evade jail time at that time. During his most recent charade, Politi assumed the persona of Dr. Matthew Mode and capitalized on the prestige that came with the identity. He worked in esteemed clinics within Bucharest, Romania, where he carried out surgeries on unsuspecting patients. But Politi's lack of medical qualifications eventually raised eyebrows among his colleagues, particularly when his technique during medical procedures was called into question. Politi struggled to perform basic medical tasks, such as holding a syringe correctly or maintaining proper hand hygiene. Politi maintained an active presence on social media, positioning himself as a world-class plastic surgeon. His Facebook and Instagram accounts showcased him dressed in scrubs, seemingly in the midst of surgery, accompanied by captions touting his trustworthiness and commitment to patient safety. He posted a series of before and after images of supposed patients who had undergone procedures ranging from breast surgery to Botox injections. The gravity of Politi's deception became more evident as investigations delved deeper. It was revealed that he had operated on 28 individuals across five private clinics in Romania, all while lacking the necessary authorization to practice medicine in the country. His procedures led to the suffering of some patients, and one woman reportedly experienced complications after undergoing breast surgery performed by Politi. Politi finally faced consequences for his actions when he was sentenced to nearly four years in jail in Bucharest for charges including fraud and intellectual forgery. Despite his efforts to evade justice, including attempts to flee the country, the court upheld his sentence. But how was he holding the syringes when his nurses noticed his inexperience? Like an ice pick? The nurses all looking at each other like, okay, our job is now to keep this patient alive. Who are the natural born criminals who are bad to the bone? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, the bad nurse. A Miami-based nurse practitioner, Paulette Padilla, found herself on the wrong side of the law when she was accused of orchestrating an elaborate scam targeting vulnerable elderly people. Her arrest came after an extensive investigation into a phone scam that's plagued South Florida and the wider United States in recent years. The scam targeted elderly individuals tricking them into sending substantial amounts of money. Detectives had only implicated Padilla in the operation, but the real issue was that she was also faced accusations of contraband trafficking. Law enforcement authorities discovered a shocking 170 pounds of skunky grass concealed in suitcases in her apartment, adding another layer to the case. This phone scam, which is growing in popularity, targets elderly victims and often involves fake emergency situations, such as car accidents or other personal crisis. In her case, at least two elderly victims have been identified, both of whom were cruelly manipulated into sending her substantial amounts of money. One of the victims, an 86-year-old woman from Chicago, was scammed into wiring $20,000 after receiving a frantic call telling her about a family member's supposed traffic accident. Although her family reported the incident to Bank of America, who initiated an investigation, the damage was done. $20,000 had already been wired to her bank account. When asked about the fraudulent transaction, Padilla was totally indifferent. 
actually asking how that was her problem. That kind of heartless response really shows the lack of empathy shown in these predatory schemes. Further investigation revealed that Padilla had sent large amounts of money to her mother and an undisclosed associate while also making cash withdrawals from a Bank of America ATM. Additional evidence on her own pointed to another victim, this time an elderly woman from New York who had mailed 22,000 bucks to Padilla and her alleged accomplices. Padilla, who appeared to lead a respectable life as a healthcare professional, was arrested and charged with organized scheme to defraud, counts of trafficking and possession of substances with the purpose of trafficking. It may just be us, but we think she's a little bow toxic. Hey Number five, chasing status. A couple of fraudsters lived like high rolling Premier League soccer players through a SIM swap scam that made them nearly 500,000 pounds. Desmond Amoko and Sammy Ibrahim had orchestrated hundreds of SIM swaps in which they replaced victims' SIM cards, gaining control over their mobile phone numbers. The scam allowed them to intercept text messages containing sensitive information, such as security codes from banks and card companies, which they used to make online purchases and bank transfers. Amoko's Extravagance knew no bounds, as he spent tons of money at upscale fashion outlets like Gucci and Louis Vuitton, dined in luxury restaurants across London, and even rented a luxury apartment. He drove a fleet of high-end vehicles, including a Range Rover, Porsche, and Bentley. Amoko also had a massive amount of shoes, because this guy's a sneakerhead. This opulent lifestyle came to an end when he was arrested at a branch of Metro Bank with a mobile phone that had facilitated more than 100 SIM swaps. Ibrahim, on the other hand, was caught in an apartment where he had concealed mobile phones and laptops containing personal and financial data belonging to over 1,500 people. In this case, both culprits were prosecuted, with Amoko being sentenced to four years for conspiracy to defraud, money laundering, and possession of articles for use in fraud. Ibrahim received a sentence of two years and four months for conspiracy to defraud and money laundering. Number four, Scammy Bones. David Bloom, infamous for being the Wall Street whiz kid who scammed millions from investors in the 1980s, was arrested in Los Angeles 35 years after serving time for his earlier scams. Bloom faced charges related to grand theft and fraud. Bloom, who was only 23 when he was first jailed in 1988, gained notoriety for defrauding over 140 clients by promising them riches through stock market investments. His victims included even his own grandmother, the Sultan of Brunei, the world's wealthiest man at the time, and worst of all, Bill Cosby. Just kidding, Bill Cosby is garbage. In this latest round of alleged scams, Bloom portrayed himself as a well-connected man with influential friends, promising his victims riches through stocks that hadn't gone public yet. Some of his claims included connections to Netflix CEO Ted Sarandos and Whole Foods magnate AC Gallo. Among his victims was reality TV star Caroline Damore, who, like many others, was taken in by Bloom's elaborate ruse. Damore was struggling to keep her company afloat during the pandemic when she crossed paths with Bloom, who befriended her at her apartment complex's first floor pool. He convinced her that he could introduce her to influential figures who would help her business, making grandiose claims about backing from Whole Foods for her organic pasta sauce company. Despite initial skepticism, Damore fell for Bloom's promises when she believed that he had set up a meeting with Whole Foods' AC Gallo. Additionally, Bloom convinced her to invest $35,000 in Soho House shares, promising an $850,000 return. It was only after a fruitless trip to Texas, where she was supposed to meet the Whole Foods boss, that Damore realized the truth about Bloom's history of fraud. Bloom's rearrest has sparked a public outcry, with more alleged victims, like life coach Sean Kushner, coming forward to share their experiences. Many have demanded justice, protesting outside the district attorney's office. Damore has been vocal about her ordeal, urging other victims not to be ashamed and to report their losses. Bloom had better watch out for all those legions of Damore fans coming for him. We're sure they there's got to be at least one, right? Number three, trust me, I'm a cop and a lawyer. Stephen Davey from Liverpool conned three vulnerable women who isn't named since the case is ongoing at the time of this video out of thousands of pounds by impersonating a police officer and a lawyer. Davey exploited their trust and stole nearly 8,500 pounds. Davey introduced himself to his first victim while visiting a sports bar in Liverpool. Presenting himself as Stephen Burns, he said he was a police officer, offender manager, 
manager and probation worker and developed a close relationship with the woman over several months. To borrow money from her, he claimed he was buying a house for the two of them to live in. The woman asked for Davies' help for a friend in a family court case after being scared of her husband. Since he claimed a law enforcement background, Davy led the woman to believe he had a friend named Simon Davy, a family lawyer who could provide legal representation. He then charged the woman for a private investigator to follow her ex-husband that he never hired, pocketing the fee. Davy manipulated the woman into not even going to court by saying that he would represent them. Davy then went to tell the woman she had been granted full custody of their children and compensation when this was totally untrue. He even produced fake legal documents and emails related to the ex-husband's parental rights. Davy sent one victim fake screenshots, saying they were from the police. He claimed that law enforcement was involved in an operation to arrest one victim's ex-husband on multiple charges. Davy also forged an email from the chief of police saying that the man was about to be arrested. Davy's manipulation extended to even convincing another victim to pay for private health costs by claiming he feared he had cancer and that a National Health Services scan would take too long. Davy's shady activities were finally exposed when staff at a Liverpool hotel where he was staying grew suspicious and Googled him. They found news articles about his previous cons and contacted the police. A search of his hotel room led to the recovery of items used in his deceptions, including police lanyards and documents the women had provided to him. During his sentencing, the judge talked a lot about the harm he caused to the children involved. Davy's extensive criminal record, including 94 offenses and 17 convictions, started in 1987 as a clear indicator of his status as a dishonest fraudster, which is a polite way of saying this guy is total garbage. He received a four-year prison sentence with a 10-year restraining order that prohibits him from contacting the victims or going to their addresses, including the Toon Hotel in Castle Street, the hotel in Liverpool where he lived. And really, it's bad enough that he was scamming people in general, but to actually scam a mother fighting for her kids in a stressful situation? What an awful human. Number two, sob stories. A pattern of scams landed Florida woman, of course she's from Florida, Laura DeKaiser, in hot water once again. DeKaiser, who was already on probation for possession, used a series of sob stories to swindle people and a local business out of more than $10,000. Her scam involved manipulating her victims with made-up stories and convincing them to cash counterfeit checks through their bank account. She earned herself some charges of grand theft, fraud, and a violation of her probation. One of her targeted victims was the local dealership, Gary Yeoman's Honda, where she managed to steal nearly $11,000. Daytona Beach Police began their investigation after an alert Gary Yeoman's employee noticed suspicious checks, presumably intended for the dealership, being cashed at various banks, including Bank of America, Chase Morgan, and Wells Fargo. The Kaiser's cons extended beyond the dealership to involve several other people, seven of whom were identified and contacted by police. Her strategy involved intercepting her victims on their way to the bank and weaving elaborate stories that led to monitoring monetary losses. At one point, the Kaiser approached a woman at Wells Fargo Bank, explaining that she had been robbed and only had a check. She begged the woman to deposit the fake check into her account, successfully withdrawing $912.54. A second victim approached by the Kaiser. Later that day at the same Wells Fargo, fell victim to a similar story, losing $1,350. The Kaiser's criminal history paints a pattern of scams and deception. While her current charges include fraud and grand theft, her previous possession convictions really show that all this woman cares about is scamming. She's a hard-working criminal who operates without remorse or conscience. Too bad she didn't put all that scammer energy into something less criminal, like just having a job. Number one, the final boss of scamming. Jeremy Wilson, a serial con artist who adopted more than 27 aliases to conduct an extensive history of financial fraud, was sentenced to 7 to 14 years in prison. His crimes involved pretending to be a former wounded army veteran to secure a BMW SUV lease and rent a luxury apartment. Wilson's criminal activities date back to the early 1990s, with a rap sheet spanning several states, including California, Montana, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. His lengthy history of being a scammer culminated in his most recent scam, which he attempted in both New York and Massachusetts. In New York, Wilson posed as a U.S. Army veteran, claiming to have two Purple Hearts and presented himself as a doctor with two PhDs from MIT, adopting the alias Jeremiah Asimov Beckingham. 
him. With this fake identity, he got himself a luxurious $5,000 a month apartment in the financial district, leveraging forged documents and checks. In Boston, he managed to lease a $55,000 BMW SUV with similar tactics. The charges against Wilson in New York included forgery, possession of stolen property, and possession of a forged instrument. In addition to his criminal activities in New York, he was also facing larceny and check fraud charges in Massachusetts. However, he had to face trial in New York before being tried in Massachusetts. During the trial, Wilson expressed his confusion about fixing his situation and admitted to running and hiding from the consequences of his actions throughout his adult life. Despite his extensive criminal record, Wilson appeared unfazed by his crimes. The prosecutor provided insight into Wilson's history, emphasizing that he had been convicted of at least eight felonies in different states. Wilson posed as an airline executive, an MIT student, an army veteran, and even a member of an actor's union in various schemes. The prosecutor presented Wilson as a serial con artist who had spent his entire adult life devoted to fraud. Throughout the trial, the defense claimed that it wasn't illegal for Wilson to adopt an alias, comparing it to a stage name used by public figures like Jay-Z or Hulk Hogan, which we're pretty sure wasn't the issue Wilson was in court for. This guy is such a scammer, the government wasn't quite sure if his birth certificate was actually to be trusted. So they just charged him under Jeremy Wilson, despite supposedly being born Jeremy Clark Erskine. Crazy thing is that Wilson was so into conning people that his first defense attorney withdrew from the case because he was worried he was being conned as well. Not exactly a good indicator that this guy was going to be getting away with anything this time. Who are some of the most low-down, despicable criminals? Let's get right to it and find out, starting with... Number 5. Throw away the key. Jesus Ayala and Zamir Keys had hit former police chief Andreas Probst with their car while he was riding his bike. They recorded the incident, and judging from what these geniuses posted online, the hit was intentional. Ayala and Keys are now both on trial for their senseless crime. During court, they giggled and grinned at each other, and it seems like Keys flipped off the victim's family during their court appearance. We covered these guys' story in a previous video, but we want to keep them in the news while the trial is still going on by the release of this video. In footage that went viral, the teens approached Probst from behind as he cycled in the bike lane early in the morning. The driver honked the horn, and then, sadly, things escalated and turned tragic. Although the teens were minors when Probst passed away, they were still charged with murder and tried as adults. Ayala and Keyes both showed no signs of remorse in court. Actually, they showed the opposite. The two hid their faces from the cameras and covered their mouths to suppress their laughter. David Westbrook, Ayala's public defender, also allegedly giggled alongside his client, which is such bizarre behavior for a lawyer who is possibly defending his client's life. Probst's wife, Crystal Probst, and his daughter, Taylor Probst, were in attendance for the proceeding, where the criminal duo also allegedly flipped them off and laughed in their direction. Although Crystal and Taylor were furious and hurt by the teen's mockery, it didn't stop them from showing up to court to bring the case the publicity it deserved. Crystal also wore her late husband's smartwatch, which he wore the day of the accident. Although the screen was cracked, it was a reminder to fight in honor of Probst's memory. The teens pleaded not not guilty to all charges. In released body cam footage directly after his arrest, Ayala seemed to be more interested in the magnitude of his crime and whether or not it would make him famous. So the attitude really isn't that surprising. And how are you going to act like running over an old man on a bike from behind is this tough guy thing that gives you street cred? There's just so much to be said about all of this, from how senseless it was to social media's effect on it, to the direction of society. Number four, the accountant. Not only did accountant Jeffrey Bevan scam $2.2 million from the Bermudan government, but he also stole 50,000 pounds from his own mother. Bevan worked as a senior manager at the Department of the Accountant General of Bermuda. The department installed a new finance system while he was there, which he exploited to steal from the government in 52 separate thefts over the course of two years. He transferred the majority of the money to British bank accounts, which he used to pay off his mortgage, invest in 11 properties, and to buy a couple Mercedes. While Bevan enjoyed a luxury lifestyle with family vacations to the Caribbean, the US, and Europe, he was hiding a big secret, his gambling problem. In six years, Bevan made roughly 18,853 online bets, which is around 260 bets a month. We're not big sports bettors here, but that seems like a lot. Bevan's family eventually returned to the UK from Bermuda, but Bevan still needed money for more bets if he was going to maintain his pace of a bajillion sports bets a month. So he targeted his mother, Lavinia. Bevan 
convinced Lavinia to write a check for 50,000 pounds, which he promised to invest on her behalf. But he never invested that money. Soon after stealing from his mother, Bevan was arrested for his crimes in Bermuda and was sentenced to seven years and four months in jail. He attended the trial for scamming his mother via video link from his jail cell. Sadly, Lavinia passed away before the proceeding, but Bevan's brother, Jason, gave an impact statement on her behalf. Jason told the court that Lavinia would be horrified by her son's actions, and the prosecution accused Bevan of taking advantage of his mother's vulnerability. The court sentenced Bevan to a further 18 months in prison, which he would serve consecutively to his prior jail term. Gambling issues can lead people to do things they normally never would, but to scam your own mom, and then she passes away before your trial? Oof. Number three, everything is staged. Here's another son of the year, Michael Sabrera. Sabrera faked his own kidnapping to scam money from his mother as ransom. Sabrera and his mother appear to be very close, especially as she was widowed. He frequently posted about her being a great mom and dedicated parent. For Mother's Day, Sabrera even wrote a heartfelt post about how his mother was a wonderful person that taught him to be strong and believe in himself. Then he scammed her a few months later. One morning, Sabrera's mother received a series of texts from her 31-year-old son claiming he was in trouble. Later that day, a man called her and demanded she wire money in her son's name to Western Union. The stranger threatened the anxious mother that he would hurt her son if she didn't cough up the money. The kidnapper then handed the phone to Sabrera, who pleaded with her to hand over the money to pay his ransom. But instead of complying with the kidnapper's demands, the mother of two decided to reach out to law enforcement. The cops rushed over to Sabrera's apartment, where the only thing he was kidnapped by was his couch. He was taken into custody and then charged with second-degree larceny and fourth-degree conspiracy. Michael sounds like a real catch, ladies, and he's probably ready to settle down with that special someone if you're lucky. Number two, responsible banking. Scammers stole $460,000 from Alex Shaw, an Australian man who was diagnosed with dementia. Alex's son, Victor, took his 78-year-old father to his local bank when a teller pulled Victor aside to tell him that his father was the victim of a scam. Alex's memory had been in decline for several years, which made it difficult for Victor to figure out how his father had lost his life savings. Fortunately, Victor found notes that Alex had taken detailing the dates, names, and conversations he'd had with the scammers. The fraudsters, who were based in Thailand, told Alex to buy hundreds of dollars worth of Apple gift cards from grocery stores and give the callers the serial numbers. They also urged Alex to transfer money into a crypto account and encouraged him to click on links promising him thousands of dollars in grant money. Alex's notes contained references to AnyDesk, a software program that grants scammers the ability to remotely access computers. Victor believed the software was the main way the scammers drained his father's account as there were several transfers ranging between 10000 and $25,000 made to an unknown individual's account. ANZ, Alex's bank, picked up on the suspicious transfers and suspended his account, but the scammers responded by coaching Alex on how to reactivate it. Once Alex regained access to his account, the scammers completely drained it. Victor filed a former complaint with ANZ, but the bank told him they were unlikely to recover all of his father's life savings. Three months later, Victor received a letter from ANZ informing him they would refund the entire amount. The bank acknowledged that it should have done more to support and protect Alex given his issues with previous scams. ANZ said that cyber criminals are known to target some of its most vulnerable customers. The refreshing thing about this story is that the bank actually said that they should have done more to protect Alex, considering banks usually just say, oh well, that's too bad for you. Instead, this bank reimbursed the full $460,000. The ending makes us happy, but there must have been some pretty obvious negligence in order for the bank to hand over that amount. Number one, instant loan blackmail. Scammers across the world use predatory loans to entrap and humiliate their victims, putting them through so much harassment that dozens of people have ended everything as a result. Although many apps offered instant loans, they usually weren't predatory, but there were some that harvested people's contacts, ID cards, and photos, which they used against their customers. If these users didn't repay their loans in time, the apps would share their information with call centers where customer service agents were trained to bully people into repayment. BBC News did a special report on the widespread prevalence of these types of scams. One victim, Bumi Sinha, turned to several loan apps to borrow 47,000 rupees, or roughly $565. The money was to help keep her afloat while she waited for business expenses to come through, and the funds were available almost immediately, although the app deducted a big chunk for expenses. Bumi was supposed to repay the loan seven days later, but she didn't have the money and had to borrow from another app to make the payment. Her debt spiraled out of control 
Google, and soon she quickly owed $24,000 to multiple apps. Debt collectors called her up to 200 times a day. They bombarded her with insults and accused her of lying when she said she'd made a payment, even though she was telling the truth. The callers knew everything about Sinha, including where she lived. They threatened to message all of the 486 contacts in her phone to tell them that Sinha was a thief and slept around. The callers also made it clear that they were prepared to tarnish her daughter's reputation too. Sinha borrowed money from friends, family, and 69 other apps. She fell into a dark depression, with her phone starting to ring at 7 a.m. and continuing all day. After repaying all of the money, Sinha prayed the calls would stop. However, one company, Asin Loan, still wouldn't stop. Sinha's hope that her life would return to normal once she took care of her debts was destroyed when a co-worker received a questionable picture of her. Although it was a photoshopped image with Sinha's head on someone else's body, it was still incredibly embarrassing. Sinha fell into such a dark emotional place that she considered ending her life. Sinha was far from the only person that fell victim to one of these scams. People across Asia, Africa, and Latin America had their lives destroyed by instant loan app scams. Most victims were too ashamed to speak up about the scam, making it easy for the perpetrators to stay anonymous and invisible. A debt recovery agent who worked at one of these call centers, going by the name Rohan, said customers would often cry and threaten to harm themselves. He went undercover for the BBC at multiple call centers in India where he recorded agents harassing clients. The agents followed scripts they were given by their managers, and after bullying and humiliating victims over the phone, the agents would hang up and laugh. Rohan and an undercover journalist posing as an investor met with Vishal Charesia, a manager at the CallFlex Corporation call center, to learn more about the company's shady business practices. Charesia explained that customers give the app access to all of the contacts on their phones. Companies like CallFlex Corporation were hired to help recover the money, and if a customer missed a payment, they would hassle the person and all of their phone contacts. The staff had permission to say whatever they wanted to get their repayment. One of CallFlex's victims was Kearney Monica, a 24-year-old student who was preparing to get her master's in Australia. Kearney's first transaction on a loan app was for $120, but soon she had borrowed $3,600 from 55 different apps. She couldn't cope with the constant harassment and vulgar messages, and when the agent started calling her phone contacts, she ended her life. Monica's father answered her phone while he was at the hospital with her. When he told the agent that she had passed, the agent insisted that she still had to pay, which, like... Who does this? Hari, one of the agents that worked at a call center doing recovery for one of the apps Monika used, was growing uneasy about his job. He worked on the team that made the initial phone calls, which were often polite at the beginning. His boss instructed the staff to completely go after customers and encouraged them to text the victim's contacts to make them look like thieves and fraudsters. Nobody took it seriously when customers threatened to end their lives, but when people acted on their threats, agents looked to their boss, Porusham Takf, for guidance. Takf was furious and told his staff that their jobs were to make recoveries. He ran the operation with his wife, Liang Tian Tian. Monika unfortunately passed a few months later. Police arrested Tak and Liang as part of an investigation into a case of harassment against the couple, but they were released on bail a few months later. However, the couple was eventually charged. They went into hiding a few months later. Who are the criminals who just can't help but commit a crime? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, call off the wedding. Bride-to-be Rachel Doran was on the run after stealing 11,000 pounds from her grooms' friends. The funds were meant for a bachelor party and had been raised by the friends of her husband-to-be. Each friend contributed 440 pounds for a trip to Ibiza where the groom, the best man, and all his friends would have fun. The trip was supposed to be arranged by Rachel and all the money contributed had been sent to her. Each friend had put in their share, and then, on the day of the trip, they met at a local pub to drink. After grabbing a few pints, they got onto a bus and went to the airport. It was when they got to the airport that they discovered that there was no trip to Ibiza. Since the boys had been planning the trip for six months, they decided to make the best out of it by booking a last-minute flight anyway. However, the groom, Chris Mann, couldn't go with them because he was way too upset by the betrayal of his bride-to-be. Chris tried calling her, but soon figured out that she was on the run. That's when he discovered something else. As it turns out, Rachel, his bride-to-be, had already been arrested for credit card fraud. 
She'd copied the credit card details of a customer at a hotel she worked at and used it. She'd already been arrested, but had been released on bail. It was while she was on bail that Chris discovered that she'd ripped off him and his friends. Rachel had also planned a bachelorette party with her friends the next month and had charged them each 300 pounds. They'd all paid in, so she took their money too and was nowhere to be seen. She was on the run with a total of 13,000 pounds. Some thought that Rachel may have orchestrated the fraud because she thought Chris had cheated on her. But we somehow don't think that's likely because if Chris's cheating was the reason she stole from his friends, what was the reason she committed the original credit fraud? Why did she scam her friends as well? It just doesn't add up. Of course, the police were called and are now searching for her at the time of this video. Rachel, if you didn't want your man to have a bachelor party, we're sure there are plenty of non-criminal ways to make that happen. Number five, all about accountability. Massey Passy completely took advantage of her position as a payroll manager and paid herself thousands of pounds to fuel her unsavory lifestyle. Massey was pregnant when she was eventually caught, but had started paying herself through hundreds of fraudulent transactions three years prior. She'd stolen so much money that the company she worked for couldn't even afford to provide bonuses for its staff. Massey carried out the scam by switching the bank details of employees and sending their wages and bonuses to her account instead. She went undetected for three years and was only caught after a finance manager noticed that employee bank details had been entered incorrectly. The audit that followed discovered that she'd stolen about £290,000 from the company through 501 transactions. The police were quickly involved and she soon admitted to her crime. When asked why she did it, Massey claimed that a bad relationship and a terminated pregnancy had driven her to her terrible habits. Unfortunately, she also also had huge debts to cover around the same time period. So she decided to start stealing money to cover her debts and also fund her substance habit. Despite being eight months pregnant during her sentencing, the presiding judge decided to sentence her to 30 months in jail. So we can all understand how bad relationships can really mess up your life. If you haven't had it happen personally, you may have been close to someone who has. We can also understand being covered in debt, and a few of us can fully understand the emotional impact of losing a pregnancy. All of that could add up to a recipe for impulsive and dangerous behavior. But she also accepted a trusted position and stole so much that her company and employees were seriously affected. Tell us what you think. Should we feel a little bad for her? Let us know in the comments. Number four, Chop Shop. Three members of the same family have pled guilty to a conspiracy where they facilitated the shipping of $600 million worth of stolen catalytic converters from California to New Jersey. Tu Su Vang, Andrew Vang, and their mother, Monica Mua, have now owned up to the crimes they committed while running their so-called business in California. The family operated an auto repair shop from their home where they mainly ran the scam. They were supplied by local thieves in the area and then shipped the converters from California to New Jersey. The three family members were paid a total of $38 million for the valuable car parts that they helped traffic. The family often shipped the converters to DG Auto in New Jersey. The company then made money by extracting precious metal powders from the converters and selling them to a metal refinery. Those precious metals, usually platinum, rhodium, or palladium, are more valuable than gold, and their value has only been increasing. Catalytic converters are a part of a vehicle's exhaust system and reduce toxic gas and pollutants from the engine, meaning they're essential parts of most vehicles. The thieves who steal them usually can grab converters from vehicles in less than a minute, so it's very difficult to stop them. The theft of these converters has exponentially risen with the steep increase in value of the precious metals used to make them. The police have now cracked down on the entire stealing and trafficking operation, and the three family members who pleaded guilty are only the first of 21 suspects to do so. Andrew Vang and Ms. Mua each face a maximum penalty of five years in prison if convicted convicted, and Tu Su Vang could see up to 20 years in prison and could be charged with a half a million dollar fine as well. So wait, the guy running an unlicensed auto shop out of the garage house isn't legit? No way! It's kind of surprising they weren't caught sooner. Number three, the worst neighbor. 
Jessica Henry scammed a Coast Guard veteran of 22 years out of more than $50,000. The scam began when Jessica met the veteran, 82-year-old Wallace Breland, at an apartment complex. She told him that she didn't have money to feed her two children and transportation to take them to school, so he took pity on her and gave her some money. He also started driving her kids to school, because Wallace Breland is a good dude, if not a bit naive. But guys like this are what makes the world go round. Seriously, he was driving her kids to school? But that wasn't enough for greedy Jessica. Wallace soon moved to another apartment, but six months later, he got a message from Jessica claiming she'd been arrested and needed money for urine tests for her probation officer. She said she needed to get $350 daily for these tests. But of course, this was all a lie. Wallace, just being a good man thinking he was helping someone in need, decided to cover the bill. Jessica's boyfriend, Gregory Dushin, also got involved and started calling Wallace, acting like the probation officer. He began to forcefully demand money for probation costs and some sometimes asked for as much as $1,500 in fees. When Wallace said he didn't have money, Dushin would threaten to seize his car and throw him in prison. Wallace got a little freaked out, so he took out a loan at a cash advance place just to pay Dushin. Whenever Dushin would threaten Wallace, Jessica would show up to collect the money. Eventually, Wallace started running out of money, became critically depressed, and complained about the situation to his veteran buddies who got the police involved. That's when Wallace realized that Jessica and her boyfriend had scammed him of more than $50,000 in fake fees. Dushin had already seized Wallace's car, and by seized, we mean he stole it. When the police finally found the car, they found Dushin driving it, and it was pretty clear the couple was scamming Wallace. They were both arrested, and soon, Jessica confessed to her crimes. But she wasn't done playing her games. While in jail, she called Wallace and begged him to pay her $1,000 bond to leave prison. He paid the bond and also gave her some money despite the court telling Jessica not to contact him. After the police found out that she'd contacted him, she was arrested again. Despite that, she still called Wallace from prison and asked him to tell the judge to let her go. She also somehow got Wallace to mail a handwritten note to the judge asking to free her. Thankfully, the judge saw right through that. The court took all of this into consideration and sentenced Jessica to 10 years in prison for disobeying court orders several times. She was also unlikely to ever pay Wallace back, even if she was out of jail, given her claimed health problems, his age, and the amount of money she stole. The fact that she actually thought getting Wallace to handwrite a letter to the judge was a good idea was actually really stupid. All it did was prove that once she was out, she would just continue scamming that poor man. Have fun in prison, Jessica. Number two, the worst gardener. Russell Joy stole almost 200,000 pounds from a 98-year-old widow whom he worked for as a gardener. Joy was hired as a gardener by Mary Bradian in 2008, and they had an initially good working relationship, until Joy got greedy and decided to begin an elaborate scam that would net him thousands of pounds. Mrs. Brady had relied on Joy for not only gardening, but also for other odd jobs around the house. She soon started trusting him with even more personal affairs, and six years later, he decided it was time to start taking advantage of that relationship. First, Joy convinced her to write checks for up to 100,000 pounds and then set up a direct debit from her account to pay his car insurance. He also got her to give him access to her bank card and PIN so that he could do her shopping for her. Joy did do the shopping, but he also made sure to spend money on himself. He withdrew 300 pounds from her account on 107 different occasions, which totals over 32,000 pounds. Joy also convinced her to cash in investment bonds that her husband had in particular intended to be her grandson in calls with the company she got the bonds through. He arranged five policies worth £229,805 to be cashed in, and he took some of that money for himself. Mrs. Brady had suffered from some hearing loss since she was 98, so Joy was able to exploit that to convince her to do things she wouldn't want. So what did he use all this money for? It may shock you to learn that Joy didn't donate it to charity or use it for cancer research. Instead, he used the money to buy himself a nice land Rover, go on expensive vacations to Hong Kong and Thailand, and buy himself 12 expensive designer watches. Just the sort of thing you'd expect a fraud like that to do. But Joy couldn't get away with his scam forever. Mrs. Brady's family started looking into her finances to organize her care after she had two falls, and they discovered his massive fraud. At first, Joy claimed that the withdrawals and payments had been gifts, given with Mrs. Brady's understanding, but he later admitted to six counts of fraud once the police were 
involved. He was later sentenced to spend five years and one month in prison, and tragically, Mrs. Brady passed away before the resolution of the trial, never getting the justice she deserved. We somehow don't think there'd be a lot of opportunities for Joy to wear his expensive watches in prison. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section which group of people you think is worse, politicians or scammers.